I was thinking maybe it would just be a good place to start um, before we talk about like all things space. Just like for both of you guys, just introduce yourselves um, and your companies. Uh, Sassy, if you want to start. Sure. Um, yeah, so I'm the co-founder and CEO of Venus Aerospace. Um, and we are actually using a next generation rocket engine. It's called a rotating detonation rocket engine um, to build hypersonic vehicles. So while this engine could be used to send more thing, more payload into space, um, we actually came from Virgin Orbit prior to working at um, starting Venus um, and recognized that this engine, um, because of its efficiency, um, opens up um, hype, opens up the hypersonic economy. Um, and so I, we actually aren't a space company, but we happen to use rockets and I come from the space industry. So, you know, very familiar, familiar with this world. So how would you define your, if like, so how, what is the main use case for the hypersonic send? Is it the yeah, so, um, transportation is the main kind of use yeah, case? So that's our ultimate goal is passenger transportation. How does the world change? You can get anywhere in an hour. Um, but it, the near term opportunity is really kind of Department of Defense applications, um, kind of flight testing, um, uh, hypersonic mat material sensors, cameras, and then ultimately kind of hypersonic drones. Um, and even like hyper logistics. So, you know, if you could deliver a part to a factory that's down in an hour across the globe, um, just opens up even global organ transplant. There's a bunch of, of use cases for really high speed travel because um, the, the world's a really big place when it really comes so down we, to it. So these would be autonomous? Uh, yes. And above Mach 5, is that what it is? Correct. Uh, awesome. And Asad, uh, tell us a little about yourself and iRocket. Yeah, great. So, I'm an engineer and uh, I started iRocket uh, back in late 2018 with a focus towards building, you know, a more sustainable space ecosystem, starting with 100% reusable launch vehicles. So at, at iRocket, we're building the first reusable rocket engines with a setup focused on reusability mm -hmm. and spinning, including high performance and, and long light. And, you know, our vision is that we want to recondition, reload, relaunch our vehicles synonymous with how we fly airplanes today in under 24 hours. And so we want to get to this next generation of reusability 2.0. We're utilizing, you know, advanced materials, reprinting, you know, everything that's, that's sort of cutting edge. And, you know, we have, um, you know, significant uh, DOD customers lined up. You know, we're partners with, um, you know, Space Systems Command and, you know, Air Force Research Laboratory and, and several several others. Um, you know, our, our focus from a national security standpoint, you know, we believe that the problem is not just to launch, you know, um, satellites once or twice, but it's operational temporal. And if our assets from a DOD perspective are completed in space, that means that a constellation is going to take them out. Which means we don't just have to reconstitute one satellite, but we have to reestablish hundreds of satellites as quickly as possible. And we're trying to build that system for DOD today so that we can rapidly launch and deploy many, many satellites in a short time frame. And, and, you know, there's also other point to point applications for, you know, the technology that we're also, you know, developing, you know, point to point rocket cargo could be really, really interesting, you know, given today's geopolitical climate, you know, I mean, if the runaways in Guam, for instance, were, were bombed, I mean, we moved 4,000 Marines from Oakland, Alabama, Guam, you know, you know, a couple of years back. And, you know, if there's no runaways for C-17s to land, you know, with submarines having limited capability, point to point rocket cargo becomes a really interesting, you know, perspective to deliver, you know, different kinds of material loads to the warfighter. Gotcha. That seems to be like a common theme between you two is like, it's kind of, uh, how can you get some, something that's essential, um, for the U S government or, or our allies within uh, a very short amount of time. And it seems like reusability is a big thing for, for you Assad. Um, one thing, so I want to start by like looking back if that's okay. And just like how we kind of got to the modern space economy that we're in. Mm -hmm. And the last time that we went to the moon was 1972. That was the Apollo missions. I think a lot of us are familiar with that story but then i think uh, at least for me like what happened after that like what from like the 80s to 90s you know the 70s um what happened in the space economy and went in like from your perspective when did things start to kind of gain momentum again and i thought maybe we can, we can start yeah I, I mean you know basically we we retired the space shuttle and 
you know, a lot of the U.S. economy, um, you know, a lot of these small manufacturers that built, you know, different components and parts for the space shuttle, you know, basically closed shop. And, you know, for, for a while, we were piggybacking off of the Russians to get to the, you know, ISS. And, you know, with the advancement of 3D printing, I think it's, it's no surprise. I mean, you know, satellites, you know, once used to cost billions and billions of dollars and, you know, now we, we think of them as, as the, um, the modern day, um, personal computer, you know, um, with 3d printing, you know, um, you have like university kids and high school kids building small satellites. Now they want to launch, um, into low earth orbit space. I mean, you have manufacturing moving to space, uh, whether you, you look at work or, uh, space pharma that are, um, you know, trying to grow perfect protein crystals in a microgravity environment, you know, to find, uh, you know, sort of the next cure for, um, diabetes or cancer. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, with the advancement of 3d printing, you know, NASA really decided, Hey, like, let's start to rebuild this, the space economy, right. With 3d printing. And that's when we started 3d printing rocket engines and, um, you know, 3D printing is so cool because, you know, with, with the IP and stuff that we've built at iRocket, I mean, we wouldn't be able to, you know, build those geometries, you know, five, 10 years ago, because, um, 3D printing allows us to, to really, really, you know, make these interpent components and make them really, really fast and, and bring the cost down by significant magnitude. And would you say this was like in the early two thousands when things started to change? Like how much was it kind of, um, ULA, uh, like SpaceX, is this when kind of the space economy started to become a lot more robust and the U S government kind of started to privatize it. And then, yeah, like how, how has that kind of changed the space economy from your perspective? Yeah. I, I mean, I think 3d printing has been around since the eighties, but you know, it's, it's really, really changed. Um, I would say probably in the last five years, you know, there's just been a really, really significant movement, you know, to the point where you can build large parts with a lot of reliability and success. And, and so we're like a large part of the space economy is like satellites, right? And, uh, Sassy, I kind of want to ask you about the satellite market, given your experience at Virgin Orbit. Um, from my understanding, there's about 8,000 active satellites in orbit today, predominantly like I think SpaceX and then USA, China, UK, making up a majority of the rest. Um, how do you think about just the satellite market? Like, are we going to have 2x 3x more satellites in space um are these like massive revenue revenue generating businesses do you think um this is more of a, like a, a government applications and there's been too much uh i guess push into the satellite market i'm curious how you kind of view it yeah you know i, th I think assad hit on a lot of it i mean some of the rant the big push in the satellites is because the satellite can be the size of the cell phone now right like we're no longer putting buses into space. I mean, back in the day, it was literally like a satellite was the size of a bus and then later made, maybe the size of a washing machine, you know, but now they're the size of cell phones and you can quickly iterate. You can put small, like I mean, Virgin Orbit, we were working on putting small satellites into launch um, um, into space with, you know, kind of a system. But that, that's really been probably the biggest innovation, I think, for the satellite world is just it's just size. Um, you know, and then I would also ar agree with Assad on, you know, why, why we've seen the massive push and, you know, with space is, is the ability to 3d print and iterate, you know, if back in the day, I mean, I think an Apollo rocket engine would have taken a full year to just build because I had to set in an ion bath. Um, and now you can literally 3d print an engine with geometries that just haven't been possible. Um, so there, there's been a, but I think between, you know, um, all, all the, benefits that we have with all the smaller components, uh, you know, the electrical systems that can get smaller and smaller, that's been a benefit of satellites. Um, and then 3D printing, I agree, also has, you know, helped with, help push, um, you know, engine and propulsion technology. And then you've also got, I mean, I always say we're standing on the shoulders of giants between, you know, SpaceX and Blue Origin and those groups that have kind of really built up an industry that is not afraid to fail. Like they move, iterate fast. I mean, NASA, um, you know, NASA has to get everything exactly perfect. And you see Elon out there, you know, blowing up starships and not, and like then celebrating. Right. And so there's, there's been kind of a change in mentality of let's go try things and go quickly as opposed to building the perfect system. And so, you know, even the cost, the cost has been driven down with some of the innovation that's happened, happened in the ecosystem. So I'm curious from like a business perspective, 
how you view these satellites though. Like I feel like as an investor, I see a lot of satellite business nowadays and there seems like there's more, more startups building satellites than ever. To your point, it's cheaper, it's easier. You can build smaller satellites. You can hop on smaller rockets and get smaller things to space. But is, is there a role, like, how do you think about the space economy going forward as like, a, like a massive business? What are some like applications that people aren't thinking of? I know there's companies that are identifying like mining sites on earth and things like that. Um, but how do you think of it beyond kind of like the, the governmental part, um, but more like commercial applications? I don't, I'm happy. Um, you know, I, I think we're just at the very beginning um, I, of, of what's happening in the space economy. I mean, the ability to get more things up into space, um, the, the sensors, I mean, you know, we're no longer limited to like, oh, there's clouds overhead, you can't see them. And there's just so many different um, different satellite applications between SAR and, and, and different ways to actually look at the earth. And so, you know, I know farmers are looking at from agriculture perspective. I mean, there's so many things that satellite technology unlocks um, that we just use on a daily basis and take for granted. Everything from, you know, our autonomous driving cars based on GPS systems and I mean, we are just at the very earliest days. I've actually, I've actually heard the analogy of um, satellite or the kind of space economy. It's almost like space tobacco. Like what really opened up the new world? Um, it was tobacco. Like that was the cash crop that got us there. And like, we're kind of at that very beginning stages where there's suddenly you can actually make a lot of money in space. Um, and it's just only going to get bigger and bigger. And then you're going to start looking at, you know, cis lunar space or look, talking about you know, what does the moon ecosystem do? And then as folks get further and further out in the ecosystem. Um, so, you know, I, I truly believe we're at the very, early, very early stages of opportunity for what's really going to happen in the space ecosystem. Yeah. And I, I think from, from my perspective, I think there's sort of three key, you know, takeaways of activities that are going to be really critical for the space economy. I think, you know, resource extraction, I think is definitely one of them. I mean, there's, there's definitely some really interesting companies that want to go out, you know, onto different planets and onto the moon. And, you know, they, they want to look for water, ice, rare earth elements, solar energy, you name it. And, you know, there's, there's several applications that could be really interesting with respect to, you know, uh, fueling spacecraft or, uh, manufacturing like we talked about, or just providing energy. Um, you know, I think space tourism and space transportation are also going to be really, really important you know, to transport people from Earth to different space destinations. And I think bringing the cost of launch down is going to play a, a significant factor, you know, in that, in that role. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard the analogy, it takes as much energy energy to get from, you know, the Earth to the moon as it does to get from like the moon to Pluto, you know? And so if, if we can get our ecosystem up off, you know, gravity sucks, like literally, <laughs> you know, so if we can get up away from the harsh gravity, you know, then then things really open up in terms of what's possible out there. What do you guys think about uh, space mining and space manufacturing? I know that's come up a little bit. Um, do you see these as like essential pillars to the space ecosystem um, to be able to manufacture uh, in space through resources we need 3D printing? I know there was experiments on NASA for a while. Now there's being slowly privatized. Um, how soon do you think this is ready for like the market? Do you think it's already been validated? Um, how do you guys think about these? I mean, I, you know, we're, we're here in Houston and so there's Axiom is working on commercial space station and has, and I know a lot of their play is kind of commercial in, in space manufacturing. I know there's quite a few other companies that are looking at that. I mean, there are things you can do in space because there's no gravity um, that just, you know, it's not possible on earth. Um, so I think that's absolutely a market that will continue to open up and develop as we can get more things into, as the cost of launch goes down. And then, you know, I think there's, you know, one asteroid is worth a trillion dollars in platinum or something like that. I mean, the, the rare earth minerals that are on asteroids are, and, you know, other resources are ex uh, incredible, you know, so the groups that can figure out how to actually, you know, get to an asteroid and actually start mining it, it's not a small play at all. So again, the, that space tobacco is truly, is, is truly the case. Asad? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. You know, I think that's going to be absolutely critical. And I think that, you know, um, with respect to refueling spacecraft, I think, you know, that kind of, that, that might be an interesting application also for resource, you know, extraction. Because you need hydrogen, you need oxygen, you know, all these, these satellites and, and rockets forward. So, 
yeah, there's really interesting as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it's almost the same analogy you can think of as kind of the gold rush, right? Like there were there were the, the railroad is what enabled the gold rush. You could get resources out there. But once you're out there, I mean, it was the people that were selling pickaxes that made a bunch of money. So it's the same thing. So, you know, as rocket, I rocket, different groups are being able to send things to space. Then once you're up there, there's so many different opportunities um, that people will be able to capitalize on. So. And from you guys' perspective, like developing like things in space, I mean, at least but for like iRocket and Venus, it's like very capital intensive and it's, it sounds like, how, how do you think about like technological development timelines and milestones and like de-risking events um, with like accessing the capital markets, working with investors and working with the government um, to bring something like this to market and commercialize it? Yeah, I, I mean, look, with, with respect to space manufacturing, I, I think some other really interesting applications, you know, are with respect to like electronics you know, and, and sort of that whole electronics industry and, and even silicon semiconductors, right? And, you know, Sarah's point earlier, I mean, it's space microgravity, you know, is a really interesting environment. And it's much cleaner than our, our clean rooms here on Earth. And so manufacturing moving to space makes a lot of sense, whether you're work or space pharma trying to, you know, produce new drugs or, you know, if you're trying to grow like fiber optics or, um, you know, build the next generation silicon semiconductor chips from like the iPhone. You know, those things could be really, really interesting. So, how how would you guys describe like the current like space era we're in? Uh, Sassy, you talked about kind of like this is like a new world um, that we're kind of experiencing. You said in some ways the railroads are just being laid, um, and it's like now we're entering like basically like unlimited opportunity. Um, how how in your mind like do you describe it? Like think about it. Um, and do you think there's too much hype? I mean, there's a lot of like space VCs now. There's so many companies. Um, or do you think uh, it's it's justified? Like, how do you think about it from a capital market uh, perspective and kind of people moving into the space? Yeah, I mean, I think you I nailed it with my the new world analogy. I mean, I think we're just at the beginning stages of what's possible in, in the ecosystem. Um, I can say, you know, at Venus, we could have used our engine, you know, we're, we're commercializing a brand new type of rocket engine and we could have used it for orbital launch. Um, and we, t we chose not to because, you know, we came from that industry and there's a lot of players chasing that. Um, and so, you know, we, we actually decided not to play in the space ecosystem with Venus, um, but that doesn't mean our, our engine technology can't be used for, you know, more efficient satellite propulsion or for, you know, more efficient rocket launch. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's the earliest stages, um, you know, and, and there's there's a lot that's going to happen with the Department of Defense. I mean, the United States set up the Space Force for a reason. You know, space is kind of going to be the new domain. I mean, I think it's been a, it's been a war fighting domain for a long time with GPS and communications and that kind of thing. But, you know, there's there's a lot of capabilities. There's a lot of things going on in space that um, that there's a reason we have an entire entirely new you know group in the DOD focused on that area for sure so how do you think about it yeah i i mean i i think i certainly agree with that it's a lot of stuff so what i know we've talked a lot about kind of 3d printing um and a lot of the rocket engines that uh, uh, are being repurposed i see for like um uh, transportation what other technology do you feel like have been like platform technologies um, that are really starting to have compounding effects um, for this space. And I think, Asad, there's something with heat shielding um, that you uh, might, might be working on. Um, but yeah, if there's just certain platforms that you like, now that we figured out X or it's becoming commoditized, this is really enabling a, a lot more innovation. I know we've talked about 3D printing and kind of smaller and smaller satellites. You know, I, th I think the reusability of rockets has been huge in its ability to drive down launch costs. You know, so the fact that you can reuse a first stage as opposed to dropping it off in the ocean. I mean, that's it's a massive capital expenditure that you don't have to use over and over and over again. Um, so I think that's that's extremely important. Um, I also think, you know, I, I can tell you on Venus's end, you know, so because we're harnessing a new type of combustion, it's called, you know, detonation. You know, the ability for high speed sensors, you know, back in the day, if you, you know, we, we're combusting at a rate that's so high that you couldn't even capture what was happening. 
Um, so, you know, one of the key technologies has been high-speed cameras, high-speed sensors, where you can, you know, get better pressure data, better temperature data, better visualization of what's actually happening. Um, so that's that's one of the key unlocks. Um, and then, you know, a, a lot of just advances in, in true manufacturing, you know, as, as we've just gotten better um, at building, whether it's the electronic sides of things or actually the full mechanical side of things, you know, better, better materials, hyper, you know, high temperature materials. You know, there's just been a lot of advances that as a society, I, I think the space industry is, again, it's standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, the other thing that I think people underestimate is, is software. You know, I, I always say that one of the things Elon did was bring the software revolution into aerospace. I mean, there are, we've got lots of friends that worked at SpaceX and, you know, the ability for them to, you know, launch a rocket, you know, gather all of the data, make changes, make decisions, recertify and go again um, is incredible. And that all has to do with data management. Um, and so when you're generating terabytes of data, how quickly can you bring in that data, analyze that data, make a decision and move out on it? Um, and that's been a huge push. You know, it's you know, I think people would be surprised some, you know, some of the old players in the industry are still pushing paper around. Um, and so moving into a more digital age with the power of the you know, compute power um, has also really, I think, unlocked that next generation of technology. Interesting. I saw what do you think? I think, I think Sassy's right on point. You know, I, I think software played a really, really interesting role in helping, in helping to automate a lot of processes and, you know, you know, now you see, you know, companies that are even using AI with, with you know, reproducing and reprinting, you know, routing mm -hmm. engines, you know, to make them more efficient, more cost efficient and, you know, bring the timeline down and, and rapidly build and rapidly reiterate. So I think that that's, that's super, super, you know, important. How, how much I'm curious, do you guys think the moon going back to the moon is like a signal of like the new space age? Um, or do you think it's more um, you know, a satellite, a satellite company like Planet Labs or, you know, going public and doing hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, more, like which is more validated um, in, from your perspective for kind of the space economy? And then, uh, yeah, maybe we'll start there. And then I have another follow-up question. You know, I, I always, I've heard space, uh, the moon is the next um, gas station. Like if you can get to the moon and then use it, um, you know, it, it, there's hydrogen, there, you know, there's ways to use it as a refueling station. And so I think the moon op opens up opportunities, um, you know, but, but showing that there's commercial viability and, you know, if, if at the end of the day, investors, investors are investing to make money, right? Like, yeah. you know, for the most part, I mean, yes, there's the folks that you know, want to invest up for, you know, out of the goodness of their heart or to push technology forward and that, you know, to change the world or to open up the solar systems. You know, but for the most part, most of them are capital, you know, they're, they're capitalists and they want to make money. And so uh, I think we have shown over the last decade, couple decades that, yes, there is money to be made in the aerospace and space ecosystem. Oops, sound like it. I got a thumbs up. <laughs> um, you know, and so um, I think that's that's part of the reason that you've seen more money going into space, into VC, VC dollars being put into those industries. Um, and, and yes, there's going to be failures. Um, but I, I think as a society, that's a huge win. Like, hey, we people went and tried stuff and maybe it didn't work, but you'd learn from it and then you can iterate and continue pushing forward. Um, and that's what that's what makes the American ecosystem so incredible. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, the, the moon as a space exploration hub is, is a really, really um, fascinating idea. You know, it's would become a stepping stone for building, you know, uh, deeper space applications. And, you know, basically be able to enable us to do missions to Mars and beyond. Um, so I, I think, you know, building on the moon could be really interesting from that perspective. And, you know, just, um, you know, we also want to mine for helium and, and other, you know, uh, rare, you know, uh, sort of minerals that we can use in fusion energy research or just sort of other scientific research that, that would benefit us, you know, tremendously here on Earth as well. So, you know, lunar exploration, I think, is, is, is definitely going to be a key, not just for deep space applications, but, you know, also for resource extraction and, you know, to, to create new industries and economic opportunities here on Earth. So just rapid fire, when do you guys think we'll get to the moon and Mars? Uh, Sassy, let's start. Like, if you had a default <laughs> market, 
not, not holding this to it. You know, I, I wish I could see I had a really good feel for it, but I honestly don't. It's not the world that I'm living in right now. Um, you know, but I know, I mean, we've got our, the Artemis mission going on. And so, you know, I know NASA is actively pushing, pushing that. We've got great, great team, great members working on that. So. Um, okay. Well, Asad, I'm not sure if you want to give you a quick answer. Otherwise, we'll, we, we have to wrap up here. So um, thank you both for joining Talking Space. It's super fun and super informative. So uh, appreciate Thanks it. For, Thanks for having me. No problem. Thanks for having us. This has been a Redbeard Ventures production.